This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. In the wonderful presence of God. I don't know about you, but when I write these, I believe them from my heart. And I'm just a firm believer in the Word of God that a thing decreed shall be established. And the world gives us enough bad news, so we need to declare our own good news. Uh, the, the scriptures teaches us in the book of Proverbs that a man shall have joy by the answer of his mouth. And life and death are in the power of the tongue. And so don't wait for somebody else to speak a blessing over you. You'd use your own mouth and speak it and declare the word of the Lord. And watch what God will do. God's an awesome, awesome God. But I want to talk to you today just from one, one verse of scripture. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9. Here's what it says. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his step. And, and I want to talk to you from this subject. Let God steer. Let God steer. Let God steer. You know, the young lady wrote a song a few years ago, Jesus, take the wheel. Let God steer. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Now, some, some versions use the word uh, establishes. The Lord establishes his steps but instead of the word directs. But you cannot establish anything that has not first been directed. And I'm glad that God, even though we make plans, God directs our steps. You know, there are some people that you might have seen years ago and you wanted to hook up with them. You were planning your way that, oh, if I could just get this one. You knew they were so fine. You just like their hair. You like their look. You like their walk. And that's what you wanted. And see, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. You sometimes, and then you see them a few years later and you say, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. Because you see, God has to direct us. You better, you know, some of God's greatest blessings to you are unanswered prayers. Because when you were carnal in the world, you asked God for stuff that wasn't good for you. And sometimes God's greatest blessing to you can be an unanswered prayer if you are asking God for something outside of God's will for you. Sometimes when you look at people, not everything that looks good to you is good for you. And you'll discover that really, really quickly when you have jumped ahead of God and made a mistake and then you realize, God, I, I see that your way is so much better. But just, I want you to also keep in mind that steps are not always linear where it's, it means just one foot in front of the other. That's, that's not always what the Bible means when it talks about steps. He, he orders our steps, one that is linear, just one foot in front of the other, taking you in a linear path. Steps are also a system of escalation. It means that you go from one level to another. When you walk with God, you don't want to just walk in a linear fashion where you're just walking around in circles at the same job for 25 years, not growing, not developing, in the same situation, in the same circumstances, dealing with the same trifling people. For years after year, year after year after year, on the same, on the same level. No, no, no. When you walk with God, you will not stay at the same level. Not when God is directing your step. God will cause you to be elevated. This is why there's always a call of the Spirit, come up hither, come up hither. That's why as you stay in a place for a certain period of time, uh, God will make what used to make you happy to be there. Now you no longer get any satisfaction out of it. You know why? That is a call to say come up to a higher level. You need some new challenges. It's time to grow. Dissatisfaction is the precursor for change in your life.
You have to get dissatisfied where you are before God can bring you to another level of life. So the steps, when God begins to, to direct your steps, he's saying, I don't want you to stay at the same level in which you were born. You're supposed to grow. Have you ever noticed how school is? You don't go to kindergarten and just let the, your whole goal be to stay in kindergarten the rest of your life. You go from kindergarten to first grade to second grade, to third grade. You don't want to be in kindergarten eight years old. In the first grade at 10 years old. No, no, no. You need to be making steps where you're stepping through that. The second, third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. You want to keep making steps where you are making vertical moves and not just linear moves. You know, it, it, it intrigues me. I, I don't understand why. But some people will act as though they've done something because they get mad because the manager wouldn't give them time off and you quit your job at McDonald's so you can go over to Burger King and work. <laughs> or Taco Bell. Or KFC. And, and you're, you're making a linear move, a lateral move. But the steps, the steps for escalation. But God says, I want you to rise up. I want you to come to something greater than where you are. There's more to see. In, in, in fact, one of the reasons that God wants us to come up is so you have greater perspective. It's for, it's for perspective so that you, we grow up in him. I'm glad that uh, you set out in your, in your mind today because nobody who's here is here by accident. Uh, you decided to show up so you can grow up, so you can then go up. But it's all about moving in a vertical direction that we want to be able to learn something. We want to be able to show up so we can grow up so we can eventually go up. And, and listen, if you want to go ahead, you have to grow your head so that we can start making vertical moves instead of just linear moves. We want to make a, a vertical leap in life. And, and I want you to realize that when God is saying here that a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his step, uh, he's not talking about, this verse is not in reference to an evil person. This verse is not in reference to an evil person. So I want you to, to remember that. He's not talking about an evil person here. The verse is not about an evil person. Because why would God want to plan uh, something for an evil person? And, and why would God direct an evil person's steps? He's not directing the steps of evil people to do evil and to create havoc in the world. Uh, so I want you to realize that God would never direct anybody to do evil. A righteous person yields to God's will. A righteous person... A righteous person yields to God's will. An evil person yells against God's will. Why, Lord? Why do you say this? They start yelling against God's will. A righteous person excels to do God's will. A carnal person rebels against God's will. So this verse is in reference to a godly person. This verse, it is in reference to a godly person that a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his step. He's not talking about evil people here. He's talking about somebody whose heart is right with God. It refers to a godly person. If God were directing the steps of an evil person, they would no longer be evil. So this is talking about a godly person. you got to have your heart right with God. Remember Psalm uh, 37, 23? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. The steps of a, what kind of man? A good man. This is a godly man. They are ordered by God. Ordered. They're, they're, there's a systemization to their life. There's an order. There's a structure. They are ordered by God. God has to say that if you do this and then I'll move you here. You, it's step by step by step. Remember, it's just a little by little. Just a, just a little by little. And I want you to realize this, that your destiny is determined not by the shoes that you wear, but by the steps that you take. It doesn't matter who your daddy was. Just because your daddy was somebody doesn't mean that you're going to be somebody. I know great people who have sorry children. No, 
no, no, I mean, really, I mean, your destiny is not determined by the shoes that you wear, but by the steps that you take. They're the steps that you take. A good man, you know, uh, the steps of a, of a good man are ordered of the Lord and he delights in his way. And, and, and I want to remind you of this. Don't trip over what's behind you. Don't trip over what's behind you. There's some stuff that's already over. Some people, you can't even live your life today because you're still tripping over an ex. Tripping over who left you. Tripping over who still owes you money. Still tripping over that. You can't even live forward today because you're upset over your baby mama, your baby daddy. Tripping over stuff that is behind you. Stuff that's already happened. Still tripping over it. Don't trip over what's behind you. If you're tripping over what's behind you, you're walking in the wrong direction. Your current steps are the most important ones. Your current steps are the most important ones. And so I, I would say to this, uh, never use your background as an excuse not to succeed. I don't care where you came from. But you don't understand, you, know, you don't know where I came from. Never use your background as an excuse not to succeed. You, you don't know about my daddy. You don't know, you know that they sold drugs in my neighborhood. Never use your background as an excuse not to succeed. And what do you do? Dare to succeed against the odds. You find somebody else that was in your neighborhood and who got out and study what they did. Find somebody else that came from nothing. Find somebody who wasn't born with a silver spoon in their mouth and they pulled themselves up and they went to school and they made something of themselves. Find somebody else who got out. And then study and see what they did. Study and see what they did. I love a quote by, by uh, uh, Steve Maraboli that says, So many will fail, not because they didn't set goals, but because they didn't set behaviors. It's not because you didn't set a goal. It's because you didn't set a behavior to get to the goal. There are a lot of people, you know, oh, I'm going I'm to I'm lose 25 pounds. I'm going to lose 25 pounds. Oh, yeah, you set the goal. You just didn't set the behavior. Oh, I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be rich. Yeah, you set the goal, but you didn't set the behavior. Yeah, I'm going to have my own company. Yeah, you set the goal, but you didn't set the behavior. It's your behavior that's going to lead you to where you're trying to go. And so oftentimes people will fail not because they didn't set the goal, but because they didn't set the behavior. You've got to set your behaviors in line with your values, your goals, your dreams. Set the behavior. And when you look at your dreams or your visions or your goals that are written, and if you don't have any corresponding behavior, you don't have anything but a wish list. That's a fantasy. A fantasy has no plan for how to make this thing become a reality. That's a fantasy. That's a fantasy. So you've got to have set your behavior. We're, we're, we're just stellar at setting goals, but we don't set the behavior. We don't set the behavior. And, and I want you to realize that when you walk with God, remember now that a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord orders his steps. Remember this now, remember this, that God not only orders your steps, he also orders your stops. And that there are some times that God will freeze you right in position when you're getting ready to do something and God will stop you. Have you ever been arrested by God? I mean, had a Holy Ghost stick up. Well, you read ready to do something and God said, don't you do it, don't you do it. And you may not even have any evidence as to why you shouldn't do it right at that time. But if the Lord puts something on the inside and says, don't fool with him, don't fool with her. If he put, he's trying to order your steps, part of his ordering your steps, it says, stop right there. Stop in your tracks. He not only orders your step, steps, he orders your stop. So sometimes God will stop you in your tracks. He'll just stop you right in your tracks. And when he does, listen, whenever God stops you, he's generally stopping you for one of two reasons. It is either for your protection, hear me carefully, it is either for your protection or it is for your perspective. And if he's stopping you, he's saying you don't have the right perspective right now. If you don't have the right perspective concerning love and marriage and God stops you from getting married at this point to this particular person, you might not have the right perspective because you might think that if they're cute enough, you'll be happy. 
And God will say, I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop this right now. And he's trying to stop us. See, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Part of the steps that God directs in you is, is saying, stop right where you are. Stop right there. Don't take another step. He's trying to work with us. He's trying to protect us from a hurt, from, from an abuse, from an abandonment, from something that you will regret down the road. And listen, you can, you can run a stop. You can run a stop, but you won't be happy about it. Oh, you pay a dear fine. I mean, I'd rather go down to the, to the traffic court and pay the fine than to have to pay a fine when you run God's stop sign. If you run a stoplight of God, God, I'm just telling you, God won't make you do right, but he sure will make you wish you had done right. And listen, as God orders your stops, as you stop, look around, look around. Look around. Because remember, I told you, it's, it's, it's either for your protection or it's for your perspective. When you stop, just, just look around. As you stop, look around. As you stop, don't, don't just run through life and, and, and you're so busy doing stuff that you don't have time to stop and look around. And God will just say, I want you to just stop and just look, look and see where you are. I want you to stop and see, see what you're doing. You know why God will tell you to look around? It's because looking back makes you smart. Looking back makes you smart. The greatest value of the past is as a teacher. Looking back makes you smart. Looking forward makes you mature. Mature people think about the future. The younger that a person is, the more immature that people are, they have no concept of the future. They're just concerned about what they're doing right now. Does it feel good now? Am I enjoying it myself now? But looking forward makes you mature. Looking down makes you wise. I mean, you have to look down and see where you could be. And sometimes see where your assignment is to be able to help others. And oftentimes your wisdom is somewhere where you have to just look down and you pick up wisdom that has fallen to the ground. And then looking up makes you strong. It looks up, it makes you strong. My faith looks up to thee. When you're looking up toward God, and you begin to, to have your hopes to arise on the inside of you. When you look up, I will lift up mine eyes into the hills. From whence comes my help? But you ought to be looking up, looking up, because your life has a tendency to move in the direction in which you look. It really does. So when you stop, look around, look around, look around. There's something to be gained in your atmosphere of where you are. I mean, I caution you with this, I, I would say this to you, as you're walking through life with God, don't waste steps. Don't waste steps. Don't waste steps. Why would I say that? Because never climb a mountain that you're commanded to move. There are some mountains, some problem areas in your life, you're not supposed to just climb it. You're supposed to move it. Speak to the mountain, said, be thou removed and cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he said. Jesus taught us that uh, St. Mark chapter 11, verse 23. Don't waste steps climbing the terrain of a mountain that God told you to speak to. Why do you keep climbing over a problem when you need to speak to them and dismiss them? Now, I don't know who that's for. Now you need to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, show me how to apply this word in my life. I'm telling you, he's a real living teacher. And, and the word will not change you because you hear it. The word will change your life because you apply it. You have to ask the teacher of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, show me the mountains in my life that I need to speak to instead of climbing. That's why you're so tired. Some of y'all wake up tired. You know why you've been climbing mountains in your sleep? It's time to speak to some things. You know, man proposes what he will do, but then God overrules and disposes what a yielded person does. But here's a great thing, that when, when, when God has stopped you, use the power of visualization because visualizing is where you begin to create your world. Visualizing. That's where you begin to create your world. Just through visualizing it the way that God has said it to you. 
And you know what I, I would say? If, you, if, you, if you're devoid of a vision, you need to get start spending time with God. You know why? Because time spent with our Creator makes you creative. Time spent with our Creator makes you creative. You become creator when you are in the presence of, of our God. Do you know who Elohim is? It's creator God, Elohim, creator God. We are made in the image of a creator God. That's why our minds are creative. That's why God gave every man and every woman imagination. It's a part of the creative element that was breathed into us from the nostrils of God himself. And this is why before you can be remarkable, you must be first marked. Before you can be remarkable, you must first be marked. And this is why I tell you, move, but let God steer. Move, but let God steer. A man's heart plans his way. The Lord directs his step. Now, 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 when you're talking about the Lord directing somebody's steps, God cannot direct the steps of a man or a woman who's seated. And this is why I said, move, but let God steer. Move, but let God steer. What good is a steering wheel to a car that won't move? Move, but let God steer. And you'll discover that the way that God steers you at the moment does not always look good and feel good. It doesn't always look good or feel good. The way that God will steer you in some moments, it won't always look good and it won't always feel good. You'll say, God, I mean, what's up with this? God will steer you down some roads that and you, you won't even understand, Lord, why don't you bring me down here? God will take you the scenic route. You know why he's waiting on us to mature? He didn't want to bring you prematurely into something for which you are not emotionally, mentally, and spiritually prepared to receive. And so, I mean, look at what happened to Joseph, the dreamer, by his own brothers. Now, God was steering. God was directing his steps. But at the moment, you know, does it really feel like this is a God thing when, when your brothers are betraying you? And plotting to kill you. And then one of them, the oldest boy, Reuben said, no, 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 let's not kill our brother. Let's, let's sell him. Let's, let's make some money off of him. And then sold him into slavery. Sold him into slavery and he wound up down in Egypt. And what did Joseph say? Joseph said, you meant it for evil. But God was directing my steps. I didn't understand why I had to go in a pit. I didn't understand why I had to go in a prison. But God was directing my steps in spite of it. It was uncomfortable at the moment. I didn't understand. Lord, how in the world can you get glory out of me being put in a pit, my being sold into slavery, my being in a jet? That's not, that doesn't sound like blessed and highly favored to me. Every now and then when you drive, when you are on the move, sometimes you have to drive through the mud. Sometimes it's a dirty road to try to get to where you're trying to get to. But let God direct your steps. Nobody would have planned to wind up in a pit nor a prison on purpose. That was never in Joseph's heart. I mean, look at what happened to Jesus who was betrayed by Judas Iscariot's kiss. And, and, and Jesus just told him, he says, friend, go ahead and do what you got to do. Go ahead and do what you came here to do. Go on and do it. Do you think that Jesus was thrilled about that? But yet his steps were being, it was prophetic. This thing was prophesied before Paul little Judas was born. That he was going to be the one that would betray him. The steps were already designed. God already had a plan in mind. And sometimes it hurts to do what is right. It hurts. It doesn't always feel good. I, I, I mean, I know sometimes if you're doing the will of God, you think that if I'm doing God's will, you know, I'm going to be blessed and just happy and so, feel so full. Sometimes uh, you, the right choice feels so wrong. Sometimes doing the right thing feels wrong. And you'll be crying as they walk out of your life. But it's the right thing to do. I mean, you'd be crying. You, you know, Lord, I, you know, I love Henry for so long, Jesus. 
Don't let them go, Jesus. Don't let them. Lord, Lord, you know ain't nobody love me like Helen. <laughs> Lord, something special about that woman. Lord. Sometimes doing the right thing feels so wrong. But here's the deal. You'll discover that eventually your story will help somebody else. Your story will help somebody else. Isn't it amazing how God lets you sometimes get hurt on your journey? And if you stay hurt, you discover hurt people hurt people, but also heal people heal people. And so if you can ever endure the hurt and realize that it doesn't have to end here in hurt, you can get healed. And then heal people, heal people. See, there's glory in the story. There's glory in the story. Whatever hurts you, God will use you now to heal somebody else in that same area. Because you're not the only one that's been dealing with the affliction. You're not the only one that's been molested. You're not the only one that's been abused. You're not the only one that's been abandoned. You're not the only one that's been lied on. You're not the only one that's been laid off. God will take something that you've been through that hurts you. You're not the only one that's been rejected. You're not the only one that's been disappointed. And God will let the hurt that you've uh, dealt with. And, and then the healing that God brings into your life. You will become proof positive that he is a healer. That Jehovah Rapha still lives. That... You know, heal people, heal people. That he delivered me and he can deliver you. When you can stand there as the testimony that it wasn't easy, yes, and I made some slip-ups on the way to my healing, but I got there. And when you get there, I'm telling you, you bring a host of other people that are looking at you, and if you said, if I got out, you can get out too. But unless you can see that God has purpose in your struggle on your pain, you will remain locked in the prison of negative emotions. Unless you can see purpose in it, you will remain locked in the prison of negative emotions. Remember that you lose your way when you lose your why. You lose your way when you lose your why. You lose your way when you lose your why. There are some people that that are walking with God and they just think that whenever you walk with God that it's always going to be a walk in the park. I don't know who told you that. God told the children of Israel, he said, I'm giving you hard shoes for a hard road. You're getting ready to climb some mountain. You're getting ready to go through some stuff here and I'm giving you some hard shoes because I'm getting ready to take you on some really rocky terrain. You're getting ready to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's going to be scary and intimidating, but you're going to come out of this thing alive. And so when you walk with God, when you walk with God, I discovered that along the, the journey, I, I, I call it MSG, and I don't mean monosodium glutamate. <laughs> but, but I mean the, the gamut of the emotions that you will experience while you're walking with God. Sometimes you'll be mad. Sometimes you'll be sad. But other times you'll be glad. It's amazing. They're, 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 they're probably our three most uh, de defined emotions. Mad, sad, or glad. Mad, sad, or glad. And somehow we are navigating through that in life. And some, some people make you mad. There's some negative things that happen that make you sad. But then there's some wonderful things and blessings that come from God that make you glad. And so you could get upset about the trials and, and, and the tribulation and the struggles. But on the other side, the stuff that makes you glad are the blessings. They are the miracles and they are the opportunities that God brings your way. So don't just uh, get locked in to one place on the journey. Just keep on walking. Keep on walking. You have to continue to walk with God. Continue to walk with God because some, some of the views on the road make you mad. Some make you sad. But if you keep walking, it'll make you glad. It really will. And may I tell you this? One of the reasons that we have some of the most cataclysmic encounters when you're walking on this journey and your steps are being directed by God because if God didn't direct you through certain things to develop you you'd never choose to go that route on your own there's some some of your greatest lessons that you ever learned never came from an easy place they never came from an easy place 
Your best teachers in school were the hardest ones. And you wouldn't have just chosen that they had to, that had to be a, a non-elective. Because there are some teachers that if you knew about them, you just wouldn't choose to go through their class. And so when you walk with God, there are some things that God will put on the journey through the direction that he's put in your feet. But some things that we go through are to help us unlearn. Some things that we go through are to help us unlearn. Because you've got people who've learned the wrong way. When you grow up in a place and they've never really learned how to love, they've got to unlearn the ways of the streets. And God will sometimes send you along a journey and its sole purpose is to help you unlearn behaviors that you picked up in an earlier part of your life. And you might wonder, God, why in the world are you doing this? You know, those trips are what I call wake-up calls. They're what I would call defining moments. They're what I call turning points. God has to take you down some roads and give you some experiences to help you unlearn things that were wrong that you previously picked up. And, and then I, I, I told you, don't, don't waste steps, but realize that there are no shortcuts to any place worth going, is what Beverly Seals said. There are no shortcuts to any place worth going. And, and I really want you to get the, the context of what God was talking about in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9, that a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord orders his steps. You don't understand the full context of that. To, to get the context of something, you need to understand what he's saying before and what he says afterwards. But I want you to just get the, some verses before it so you really understand the context of what God is saying in, in Proverbs 16, 9. If you look at Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6 through 8. Now notice what he's saying here. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, man, men depart from evil. And then verse 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. And then 8, better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. And then he goes into verse 9 about a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. He's directing the steps of a person that mercy and truth has purged iniquity from. A man whose ways now please the Lord, and he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And even though he doesn't have a, a whole lot, but better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. You know, John Piper said that God is doing 10,000 things in your life and you may only be aware of three of them. I want you to think about that for a moment. God's doing 10,000 things in your life right now and you may only be aware of three of them. I mean, when you really think of the awesomeness of, of what God is doing, see, people start focus on what he's not doing and what he hasn't done yet. But when you think about the 10,000 things that God is doing on your behalf. It, it, it ought to overwhelm you with his goodness and his grace. Now I want you to see what he says in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 3. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Commit it. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. You see, the only way to have our thoughts established is to commit our works to the Lord. Commit your works, whatever comes out of your mind, out of your imagination. And see, the great concern of our souls must be committed to the God of grace with a dependence upon him, with a submission uh, to him in the conduct of grace. Because we have to come to that place where we trust in the providence of God, where you trust in his sovereignty over your life. Commit whatever you have in your mind or your heart to the Lord. Commit it to him. Whatever you have in your, in your mind or your heart, commit that to the Lord. Now listen, here's what I would say to you. Write your plans in pencil, then submit them to God. Write your plans to him in pencil and then submit them to God. Do you know how rare it is that things turn out exactly the way you planned it? 
It is so rare. You think that I'm going to finish school and this is going to happen and this is going to happen and this is blah, it is and this is going to happen and this is going to happen. There's going to be so much stuff that you didn't see coming. Because a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Because some stuff is going to come at you and God has to be directing your steps. And if God was not directing your steps over here, you would have been walking down this road and you would have gotten hit by a boulder. But God had you to shift over to the left or to the right. And, and it avoided some things. And you didn't understand why God was saying, stop right here. Maybe he knew that an avalanche was getting ready to happen right ahead. And had you been so set on trying to go and force your way, you would have missed God's will and then you would have been killed by an avalanche. And so, as I said, oftentimes when God stops us, it is for our protection or for our perspective. But write your plans in pencil and then submit them to God. And I want you to think of that as though you are committing a dead body to the ground. You know, when we go out to the cemetery, the many times that I've done that, that's called the committal service. It's the last thing that you do when a person dies as a part of that funeral service is you go out to the graveyard and you commit the body. You commit the body. You commit the body to the ground. And when you commit that body, you don't go back the next day and dig it up. The body is committed. Now, I don't know why, but you know, one time while I was out to the cemetery and I was committing a body and uh, there was a Catholic priest who had just done some kind of committal service. And, and he says, I, 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 was, I, I didn't have gray hair then. And, and he says, you, you, you young preachers, you, you have it easy. He said, because when I came into this, he said, we would have to sit out at the graveyard until the sun went down. I'm like, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to play that kind of voodoo. I, <laughs> I'm not going to be out here in the graveyard after dark. I, I, I don't. And he told me that they would have to sit there with that body until the, until the sun went down. I mean, I don't know whether to make sure that they were dead or what. I don't, I don't know. I don't know whether they're calling a name and waiting on to hear some tapping or something. But I'm like, the kid is not going to be out here in the dark. I'm not going to be out here in the dark. We're going to do this early in the day. I don't even do funerals after 2 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> but you need to commit your way to the Lord. Commit that thing. Submit it to God. Write your plans in pencil. Write your plans in pencil. May, may I remind you of this? Failure is written in pencil. It's not the end of you. And when you commit that thing to God... What you're really doing is that you're giving God full editorial rights. You commit your mind and plans so as necessary, God can edit, God can delete, God can correct, and God can add to whatever he needs to add to in your life. You commit it and let it go. Commit it to God. He's the master editor. It's his script anyway. He's the one that's going to write in it what he wants to have in it. You can plan your way, but the Lord directs your step. I just remind you, stop stressing over what you have no power to control or change. Stop stressing over what you have no power to control or change. Just stop stressing over it. Commit it to God. Commit it to God. Say, God, however you need to edit this, however you need to edit it, however you need to edit it. And see, the Word of God defines God's will for us. The Word of God defines God's will for us. Stop seeking a word and start looking for a verse. Start looking for a verse. Start looking for a verse. Don't wait for God to lead you to do something that he's already given you instruction in his word to do. Don't wait for God to lead you. He doesn't have to lead you to pray. He said men ought always to pray and not to faint. He shouldn't have to lead you to pray. He's already given us a directive in the scriptures. You don't have to seek God about what he's already given us a directive in the word to do. I want you to notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 12 and then verse 18 in the amplified version of scripture. He says, everything is permissible for me. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. He says, but not all things are beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything and brought under its power, allowing it to control me. 
Paul has said, listen, I, I, I'm not going to, I'm going to be under control of other stuff. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to be in control. Now, and then notice what he says in verse 18. He says, run away from sexual immorality. It didn't say pray it away. It says run away. <laughs> it didn't say plead the blood. It says run away. <laughs> now I want you to notice this. Run away from sexual immorality in any form. In any form, in any form, whether thought or behavior, whether visual or written, run away from it. Don't try to pray it away. Don't try to recite a scripture. Run away. Run away. Listen, if you're hungry, don't try to pray the scent of food coming up your nostrils away. Run away. Run away. You've got to get away. You've got to get away. Flee sexual immorality. Flee it. Flee fornication. He says, flee it. Run away from it. Run away. That's a directive in Scripture. You can't just, just beat in with sweat coming off. Lord, you know it's sure it's getting hot in here. <laughs> Lord, you know I'm trying to do what's right. But I'm just a man. I'm a man. No, no, no. Flee it. Flee it. Joseph got out of there when Potiphar's wife grabbed a whole heat. He said, you can have that stuff. I'm getting out of here. You can't rebuke it. You can't pray it out. You can't try to just, you got to flee it. You've got to change your position. Don't ask God to take away from you what he told you to run away from. Let me say that again. Don't ask God to, to take away from you what he told you to run away from. There are some people that God will tell you, run, 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 Forrest, Run. Some people are walking right into the danger. Pray for me, Rev. Pray for me. No, 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 no. Nobody's prayer is going to help you in an area where God said run. Nobody's prayer. But just remember that the power to define is also the power to determine destiny. So stop creating your own definition and use the ones in God's book. Use the ones in God's book. We don't have the authority to change what God defines. We have no authority to change what God defines. But definitions are very important because he who has the power to define is also controlling destiny. But I want you to understand this. If you can't define it, you can't create it. If you cannot define it, you cannot create it. If, if you can't define an idea, you can't create it. If you can't define a dream, you can't create it. If you can't define a vision, you cannot create it. But I also want you to understand this. If you cannot define it, you cannot defeat it. You see stuff coming at you, and if you can't define it, you can't defeat it. If you've got a sickness in your body, and if the doctors cannot define it, if they don't know what it is, they can't defeat it. You know when uh, doctors are scratching their head, when, you know, it's a nebulous term, meaning that they don't really know how to stop this, is they tell you you've got a virus. Isn't that, a, isn't that amazing that they can't do a blessed thing about a virus? You go to a doctor, it's a cold virus, isn't it? You can't go to a doctor and get a shot and just clear your cold up. I'm in the doctor's office one day and the doctor's sniffing himself. <laughs> you can't help my cold and you, you got one. Your nose is running. You can't even figure that out. But you see, if you cannot define it, you cannot defeat it. And some of you got enemies coming against you. If you haven't defined it, you don't even know who your, what your problem is. Sometimes you're fighting against stuff that's not even your problem. You got to define it. You can never defeat something that you cannot define. Remember the power to define is the power to determine destiny. But don't try to rush things that need time to grow. You cannot rush growth. Don't try to rush things that need time to grow. Have you ever noticed... You walk with God. That's, that's never, you won't find a scripture that talks about running with God. It only talks about walking with him because God is never in a hurry. It's wait on the Lord. It's about the patience. Wait on the Lord. Don't try to rush it. Don't try to rush it. Don't try to rush it. And listen, when you are really submitted to God, you have to realize a man's own mind and heart might plan his own way, but the Lord directs his steps. In other words, God is saying, don't, don't stay married to the script of what you had planned. 
Because there are some people that, that create their little vision charts and they want to do everything. They want every I dotted and every T crossed. And they don't realize this may not be the will of God. You might be trying to climb the ladder of success only to get to the top and realize that your ladder was leaning against the wrong building. And now what do you do? And this is one of the reasons why James gave us the directive in James chapter 4, verse 13 through 15 in the Message Bible. Notice this. He says, and now I have a word for you who brashly announce today, at the latest, tomorrow, we're off to such and such a city for the year. We're going to start a business and make a lot of money. You don't know the first thing about tomorrow. You're nothing but a wisp of fog catching a brief bit of sun before disappearing. Instead, make it a habit to say, if the master wills it, and if we're still alive, we'll do this or that. You know why? Because a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his step. Just, 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 just keep that in mind. Just keep that in mind. And I want to admonish you with this. Don't identify yourself by your hands, but your heart. Don't identify yourself by your hands, but your heart. Your, you know, your reputation is what people think about you. That's based on the works of your hand. But the character of your heart is who you really are. Those are two separate things. Don't identify yourself by your hands, but your heart. I mean, when David killed Uriah so that he could be with Bathsheba, he had clean hands but a dirty heart. And this is why the Bible says in James chapter 4 and verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. When he's talking about this, this is not just talking about the person who's struggling with sin like the person that he describes in Romans chapter 6, but this is talking about a double-minded person. This is a, this is a man, a woman with two souls. This is a hypocrite at its highest and best. And he's saying, cleanse your hands, purify your heart, purify your heart. This is a call for inward sincerity. And you see, when you walk with God, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. When you walk with God, God will ultimately lead you closer to him. He'll never lead you away from him. When you walk with God, as God directs your steps, he's always really bringing us to himself. He said it in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 4. He says, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians You know how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. I brought you to myself. I brought you through the desert, but I brought you to myself. God brought them to himself. And as he orders your steps and directs your steps and establishes your steps, God's trying to bring you to himself. So to walk with God simply means to be drawn to him. He's saying, come near, come near. Come near. And when you come near him, as you behold him, you become like the one that you've drawn so near to God to see. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.